This is a CBS News special report. I'm Nora O'Donnell. We are coming on the air with breaking news from the Supreme Court, where the justices have just ruled on a case that could impact the prosecutions of hundreds of January 6 cases, as well as the special counsel case against former President Trump. The question before the court was whether prosecutors can apply a law passed in the wake of the Enron scandal to those who breached the Capitol. Former President Trump was also charged with two counts of obstruction for his alleged attempt to overturn the 2020 election results. The law as written makes it a crime to corruptly obstruct or impede an official proceeding. Now, defense attorneys argue that the Department of Justice has turned the law into a dragnet. Before the attack on the Capitol, federal prosecutors had never used the statute in cases that did not involve evidence tampering. Let's bring in CBS News chief legal correspondent Jan Crawford. I know you just started reading the ruling. How did the justices rule? Well, it was a vote of 6-3, a somewhat unusual lineup. The chief justice is writing this decision uh, with some of the conservatives, but also joined by liberal justice Katanji Brown-Jackson to vacate a lower court ruling that had allowed a broad interpretation of this uh, obstruction statute, which, as you mentioned, was then applied to several hundred January 6 defendants, including one former president, Donald Trump. This charge represents the basis of two of the four charges against President Trump. So the question now is, because the court is narrowing prosecutors' use of this statute, in what cases could it be applied? I think it's very important to point out that even with this decision, which is saying that prosecutors have been using this charge too broadly, uh, they've got to narrow it, tie it to some destruction of evidence, which is in the clause uh, right before the charge they've been using, that even with that, this does not mean that prosecutors can't charge all these January six defendants with obstruction of an official proceeding. It has to be tied to some kind of destruction or tampering with evidence or documents. But what was in, happening in January 6? What were what was happening in that Capitol? There was evidence. There was there were papers, there were certificates, state electoral votes. So I will be shocked if special counsel Jack Smith does not have court papers ready to say that he can still charge former President Trump with obstruction arguing that he was trying to interfere with the counting and the, the counting of those state electoral votes, which were paper, which were evidence. The reason this case is important, and you pointed it out, is this is a Supreme Court uh, that has been really concerned about prosecutorial overreach, uh, that they're taking cases and charging people under criminal laws that Congress may never have intended. They're expanding the use of the criminal law in ways they shouldn't do. This is a court that has unanimously reversed convictions, for example, of the former Virginia governor who was charged under a bribery statute. And so it's consistent today with what they're doing, that prosecutors can't just look at a law and say, yeah, that would fit. Uh, they have to make sure that it works in the statute and what the laws that were before it, just preceding it. And also the purpose of the law. The purpose of this law, Congress passed Sarbanes-Oxley, the wake of the Enron accounting scandal. And this specific charge was to close a loophole that Enron auditors had been able to get off because they had shredded documents. And so this was in response to that, to address that kind of tampering of evidence, destruction of evidence. So today the court is just saying, you just got to look at that and make sure that is what's happening. So, you know, 6-3, yes. as I said, a big decision, a win uh, for some of the January 6 defendants, certainly, but not necessarily a big win for former President Trump. Jan Crawford, thank you. We should note this case is the first in which the Supreme Court has been tasked with tackling fallout from the January 6th insurrection at the U.S. Capitol. I want to bring in our chief Washington correspondent, Major Garrett, and to discuss the real-world implications. Sure. This involves a man named Joseph Fisher. Mm -hmm. He was a police officer in Pennsylvania. He attended that Stop the Steal rally outside the White House and later entered the Capitol around 3 25 on January 6. Prosecutors said that he charged officers there. He faced, was faced with assaulting a police officer, disorderly conduct, corruptly obstructing and influencing and impeding an official proceeding. That's what's at issue here. This is him inside the Capitol, this picture. And he's, his attorneys said, no, you can't use that. That's too broad of right. a reading of that particular felony that was leveled against him. What happens now? So the key word you just used there, Nora, is felony. 
This charge brought a potential jail sentence of 20 years. It was a point of leverage federal prosecutors used not only with Mr. Fisher but others either to win plea deals or to make them understand the consequences of their actions on January 6th. And Mr. Fisher's attorney said, is entering the Capitol, is disrupting the certification of electoral votes the same thing as destroying evidence? which is what the statute is specifically about. They argued it wasn't. The Supreme Court has now agreed with that. What's interesting about this moment, Nora, is right after January 6th, there was a momentary consensus in this country, shared by a great number of Republicans, who said the following. Those who entered the Capitol acted as rioters should be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. Those are Republicans who Republicans said who said that momentarily. They've since backed away in large measure from that, but fullest extent of the law. That's the central question here. What is the fullest extent? Did Congress intend for someone who disrupted the peaceful transfer of power to be someone prosecuted for tampering with evidence? The Supreme Court said, no. Those who defend the statute and the application of this law said, this is a unique moment. Destabilizing the peaceful transfer of power in this country must have deterrence built around it. It's and such a unique tool, occurrence. Right, and every tool that prosecutors can find should be used to legally deter people in the future. Because if we don't deter Americans from trying to block the peaceful transfer of power, do we still retain a constitutional republic? The Solicitor General, in her arguments, the U.S. Solicitor General, tried to remind the justices of the unprecedented nature of the events on January 6th. I want to bring in congressional correspondent Scott McFarlane, who's been tracking all of these cases related to January 6th. I dare say there is no one who knows more about these defendants than Scott McFarlane. You just can follow him online. Let me ask you, what do you think this means? It's going to have a limited impact on some of the defendants, including those who are in prison right now, Nora. The Department of Justice hasn't just used this charge in January 6 cases. They've used it frequently, and they have used it effectively. By our CBS News count, about 350 of the 1,400-plus January 6 defendants faced that charge, among others, obstruction of an official proceeding. As of today, roughly two-thirds of them still have that charge, either on their record or pending. That's about 250 people. And that's going to include people who beat police officers. It will include those names you might remember, the Proud Boys, the Oath Keepers, those far-right groups. But there's a smaller subset, according to our CBS News review, of about 30 defendants for whom that's the only felony charge. Those cases include people who are in prison as we speak. Those prison sentences might have to get reviewed. You might ask yourself, what about all those other people who also face that obstruction? It certainly means they could be let out of jail early. In fact, Nora, according to our review of the court filings, some of the defendants who were convicted on that charge or pleaded guilty to that charge have had their prison sentences delayed or have received release early pending this decision because the judges recognize some of these prison sentences might need to get revisited if the Supreme Court did what it did today. But for all the others, those who were convicted of it, who pleaded guilty to it, who've already served their time, the Department of Justice sources with whom we're speaking don't think they're going to go back and try to reopen plea deals. That's a dangerous world. That man is worth noting. Kevin Seafried of Delaware, seen there famously parading the Confederate flag right past the U.S. Senate January 6th. He was released from prison early in late May, according to my review of the court filings, because he cited this argument. The Supreme Court review itself, among other things, he faced that obstruction charge. And the judge agreed to release him pending his appeals because they may have to recalibrate the prison sentences based on this decision. And one other note, we went through all the court filings and all the trials. All the federal judges in Washington, D.C., thought this appeal was offline, that it wasn't right, that it wasn't justified. But there was one judge, a judge named Carl Nichols, a Trump appointee, who bought into this appeal from Joseph Fisher and hit, began this trajectory towards today, where it gets to the U.S. Supreme Court. And, and one other note, Nora, I should add, there are so many defendants in this, the largest criminal prosecution in U.S. history, 1,400. Joseph Fisher is one of two Joseph Fishers, who are former police officers charged with January 6th crimes.
There is so much to digest, and the implications are potentially far-reaching. Scott McFarland, thank you for walking us through that. We should also note that this decision today by the Supreme Court could be used as fodder for claims by Trump and his Republican allies that the Justice Department has treated these Capitol riot defendants unfairly. We saw Donald Trump in the debate last night saying that some of these rioters were, quote, ushered in by the police. He even said some of them are, uh, quote, so innocent, in his words, and, quote, peacefully patriotic. So the question is what will happen to these some 30 uh, defendants who have been convicted on this charge, who are in jail that uh, Scott just talked about. And then the other big question is how does this affect Donald Trump himself? Let's bring in former Justice Department prosecutor Tom Dupree on that matter. Tom, what does the special counsel Jack Smith do now? Well, I think what the special counsel needs to do is to look at the precise acts that he was planning to charge former President Trump with and in connection with this claim and see whether or not he still can prosecute Trump on this charge, given the Supreme Court's decision. Look, the January 6th was obviously an extraordinary and a terrible day in our nation's history, but this Supreme Court decision is fairly straightforward. Uh, the court in recent years has taken the approach of construing criminal statutes literally somewhat narrow. So in that respect, today's decision isn't a particular surprise. I think the task for the special counsel is to say, OK, the Supreme Court has spoken. It's told us what this law covers and what it doesn't cover. And so I need to go back, dust off the allegations, and see whether or not the facts and the evidence I have in my possession are sufficient to state a charge against former President Trump under this new standard. Stand by, Tom Dupree. I want to bring in Jessica Levinson, our CBS News legal contributor. She's also a Loyola Law School professor. And Jessica, I know you have been reading the dissent here, an interesting coalition of justices on this. Tell us what you see. I see Justice Barrett writing for two liberal justices herself and Justices Sotomayor and Kagan. And this is a pretty stinging dissent where she says, I'm looking at the statute and why can't you accept that the statute is broad? Why can't you accept majority that or otherwise allows for the prosecution of people who walked into the Capitol on January 6th and engaged in a riot? Because she's saying, and this whole dissent is tied so closely to the words of the statute, she says, or otherwise means you tried to corruptly impede a official proceeding, and a riot is enough to do that. It doesn't have to be tied to document destruction. She uses words like that the majority here is disingenuous, that they do textual backflips. And it's so interesting to see somebody who is appointed by former President Trump saying, give the prosecution credit, give, allow them to look at this statute. Congress meant this to be a broad grant of authority for them. And she obviously didn't win the day, but very interesting lineup because I know the headline will be six to three, but we really have to look at who makes up the majority in the dissent here. Jessica, can I ask you about what the majority said? Because some of the concerns that were raised in the discussion about this case earlier, Gorsuch, Justice Gorsuch, for instance, they said, well, what, what prevents using a broad interpretation of the statute when someone disrupts a Supreme Court proceeding or something like that? Why, why isn't that viewed as distinct from the certification of a presidential election? This was such a unique well, instance. This is a unique instance. I think what the majority would respond is, it's not our job to determine which type of official proceeding is important or different. It's our job to look at the words on the statute and say, what exactly does somebody who's charged under the statute need to do? And what the Supreme Court, what the majority is saying here is, it can't just be walking in and engaging in a riot that stops either a Supreme Court proceeding or a city council meeting, or in this case, the counting of electoral college votes. That it has to be tied to some sort of document destruction. So I think, and it's a, such a good question, I think what the Supreme Court is saying is, it's not about how much we care about a Supreme Court proceeding 
or something so important. Let's remember the certification of the Electoral College votes is about the peaceful transfer of power. It's something we hold so dear. The court is saying today, we're not talking about the importance of that. We're talking about the words in the statute and how broadly or narrowly we can read them. It's the dissent that seems much more worried about the consequences here in my mind. Jessica Levinson, you explained this so well. I really want to be a student in one of your classes because <laughs> I think I could go around about an hour with you on this. This is so infa fascinating to me and, of course, such an important case, uh, not only for the nation, but also those dozens of defendants who have been charged with this felony and how this will affect the prosecution of Donald Trump. And on that matter, per our Rob Laguerre, who covers the Justice Department for CBS News, Jack Smith, who's the special counsel, is declining to comment on the Fisher ruling at this time, but no doubt we will probably hear more from him in the future. Once again, the breaking news from the Supreme Court, the justices have ruled six to three in favor of some of the January 6th rioters, limiting the use of these obstruction charges. It was a novel charge that's also been brought against former President Trump. It's an Enron era uh, obstruction charge, and so the justices want a more narrow reading of this particular law. We're also, we should note, awaiting a ruling from the Supreme Court on whether former President Trump has absolute or qualified immunity for conduct that allegedly involves his official acts during his time in office. That is expected to come as early as Monday, the last day of the term. Our coverage will continue on CBS News 24-7, your local news, and then tonight on the CBS Evening News. Thank you for joining us. This has been a CBS News special report. I'm Nora O'Donnell.